Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us today from all over the world. I can see the names. I can see quite a few familiar names and some new friends. Thank you very much for joining today's session under the South Asian Regional um, Climate Resilience which is being organized uh, as a part of COP26, uh, which is currently going on in Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, I am Hasib Mohammad Irfanullah. Uh, I have been working as an independent consultant in the climate change, environment, and research system sectors. I'm also associated with uh, ICAT, uh, International Center for Climate Change and Adaptive Development. You are, uh, many of you are familiar with uh, this organization. Uh, today we will be talking about, as you know, uh, nature-based solutions, uh, which is one of the agenda items uh, in COP26 as well. There are four themes that are being discussed and not necessarily negotiated, but discussed widely. Finance, uh, wider collaboration, uh, mitigation, obviously, we are looking forward to having net zero, and uh, adaptation and nature. So we'll be talking mostly about adaptation and nature. Uh, based solutions. And uh, we, uh, we all more or less are aware of nature-based solution, which, is, which means using nature or ecosystem services for, for, our, you know, for our benefit uh, and uh, for, for overcoming challenges like uh, societal challenges like climate change, disaster risk reduction, water security, health issues that we are all facing as well as biodiversity degradation. But while we will be focusing on nature-based solution, how it can help us to adapt to climate change or to mitigate, because there are lots of studies over the last few years that is being conducted uh, to establish the potential of nature or ecosystem services for our benefit, especially to tackle climate change. But often it has been asked that how effective is nature-based solution, given that fact that nature is quite susceptible to climatic factors. And uh, you can't actually move or change or grow a plant very quickly. Sometimes you need rapid, sudden measures to tackle climatic impacts, if, especially if they are sudden onset. But it is not only the effectiveness of nature-based solutions we need to look into, but also how to maximize the benefit of existing nature-based solutions. Although the term is quite new, but we all know that conserving, protecting, really managing, uh, often sometimes creating uh, ecosystems uh, are some examples of nature-based solutions. There are certain limitations, so there are certain questions from certain sectors that how to overcome those limitations, how to avoid the misuse of nature-based solutions. And finally, how to mainstream nature-based solutions so that the financing, the policy instruments can help us to get benefit out of nature-based solutions. We have, uh, as you can see from uh, on the screen, that we have fantastic panel, as well as uh, three fantastic presenters who will be sharing some interesting findings. I'm saying uh, because it is uh, they are interesting findings because I haven't been involved into some of those research but they are really quite uh, eye-opening. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that you will also enjoy learning those new, very freshly uh, conducted research. Uh, after listening to the speakers, we will be also hearing from uh, our uh, two of our esteemed uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, you know, that will be a fantastic uh, uh, part of this uh, one and a half hour session. Uh, I would like to uh, close my opening remark now, and I would like to hand over to uh, Alex for moderating the rest of the session. I may come again at the end of the session. So thank you once again very much for joining us. Alex, the screen is yours. Great, thank you, Hasib. I'll share my screen now. Uh, I need the other person to, yeah, thank you. Great. Great, so um, I'm, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm based at the Nature-Based Solutions Initiative, uh, focusing on, on uh, nature-based solutions uh, in climate change adaptation and development. And the initiative aims to generate knowledge on the potential of nature-based solutions to support their scaling up by working at the science policy um, interface first and foremost. Um, and it's a pleasure to be talking with you uh, today.
so I'll introduce four overarching policy guidelines, um, which uh, were produced uh, in anticipation of COP26 with 20 partner organizations in the United Kingdom uh, to guide policy on, on non-nature based solutions. And these have now been taken up by over 40 organizations and we hope more will follow suit. Uh, their overarching objective is to provide uh, policy guardrails for the incorporation of um, nature-based solutions in international and national level policy. Uh, the first guideline makes it explicit that nature-based solutions are, are, are not a substitute for delaying a rapid phase out of fossil fuels. And a very good reason for that is that the um, is that nature-based solutions are themselves sensitive to the level of warming. Um, for example, the carbon binding potential of vegetation is, is, is temperature dependent. And we know that without rapid emissions reductions, the impacts of climate change, such as fires, droughts, and disease will cause carbon in ecosystems to be released back into the atmosphere. The second guideline is that nature-based solutions are not just about planting trees. Uh, or restoring forests. We need to focus on the protection, the restoration, and the sustainable management um, of a range of different ecosystems and, and, and working landscapes. The third guideline emphasizes that um, we also need to focus on, on people uh, and the social systems in, in the landscapes where nature-based solutions take place. People inhabit and depend on the landscapes we consider nature-based solutions uh, in, and they are uh, people are integral to the functioning of nature-based solutions and the delivery of benefit. Therefore, the third guideline em emphasizes that effective nature-based solutions are designed, implemented, and managed by or in partnership, um, in close partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities. And stakeholder perspectives are particularly important um, to frame the design of the solution as because the solution has to work for them. And lastly, um, because biodiversity is crucial to the delivery of benefits from nature, we need to ensure that nature-based solutions support healthy ecosystems and biodiversity in all of its forms. Uh, single species plantations may seem like a quick win for carbon storage, but they do not benefit biodiversity. And research shows that uh, their carbon stores are not as resilient to climate change as those of, of native um, forest ecosystems. Interventions that, that focus on biodiversity in terms of species functions and habitat types and the connectivity of ecosystems are more likely to be resilient and thus effective in the long term. And that's what the, the fourth guideline really uh, puts the emphasis on, to do, that NBS should be designed to provide measurable benefits for biodiversity. Um, I will, so these are the four guidelines. I will leave it off, leave it at that, and we and welcome the, um, the three speakers. Let me first stop sharing my screen. Second, great. So the, the first speaker that we have today, it's my pleasure to welcome Stephen Voronecki, and I will let each speaker introduce themselves. The floor is yours, uh, Stephen. And if you have any issues sharing your slides, let me know and I can share them. Okay, do you see that? Okay. Yeah, that's perfect, Stephen, thank you. Great, thank you very much, um, Alex. Um, Warmly welcome everyone. I'm joining you from Glasgow. Uh, it's a beautiful morning here. Uh, thank you very much Tasfia for your invitation to participate in this session and um, I'm so glad that we have a good uh, audience. Thank you so much for joining from wherever you are. So my name is Dr. Stephen Wojniecki. I'm a postdoctoral researcher. Um, I'm based at the University of Linköping in Sweden. And I'm also a research associate um, with the Nature Based Solutions Initiative. So today I'm going to be presenting uh, for about 10 minutes on some recent findings that I've been doing in collaboration with uh, Alex and Hasib and some other researchers. We've focused on 
the nature-based solutions and their role in contributing to reducing people's climate vulnerabilities across the rural global south. And this is the first time we're presenting these findings. And we'd be well, uh, we'd really welcome your feedback as well. So do feel free to uh, reach out to me uh, at my email or get in touch with one of the MBSI um, staff and we'd be happy to uh, discuss these uh, going forward. Right, so I'll start by stating something fairly obvious to most of you, that we are living in a time of great danger, that there is climate risk here and now. It's not a, it's not a future phenomenon. I, um, this fantastic website, uh, Climate Action Tracker, they've been updating their model throughout the uh, Glasgow COP26 conference. And as things stand, we are facing um, with current pledges and current policies between 2.4 and 2.9 degrees of uh, global heating. So in that context, there's an, a great need for uh, reducing people's vulnerability here and now, and also planning for um, even greater needs in the future. But it's not just a climate crisis, we're also facing Sing an interrelated biodiversity crisis as well. So, for example, the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services has showed that natural ecosystems have declined by 47% on average and that 25% of all species are already threatened with extinction. So, in that context, nature based solutions have been suggested as a promising approach that can uh, deal with. Uh, those uh, challenges in an integrated way. And in this study, we're defining nature-based solutions as working with and enhancing nature to address societal challenges, including climate change impacts. Sorry for the typo there. Um, and that is across a wide range of landscapes. Uh, as you may see, the great focus is on forests, but we're thinking about um, nature-based solutions in a much broader set of landscapes, uh, ecosystems, and social contexts as well here. And another promising aspect of nature-based solutions, as you're probably aware, is the focus um, on their potential co-benefits, especially for um, enabling the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, and kind of drawing some of the links and uh, synergies between these goals. Okay, but I'm just going to uh, backtrack a little bit because we need to understand a little bit about vulnerability, right, to understand what we're doing here with this study. Why focus on vulnerability and not adaptation, for example? So the point is that around the world, people are already suffering from the impacts of climate change, as I said previously, and communities across the global south are, are already being especially badly hit. But the issue is that most studies on nature-based solutions for understanding climate impacts and the contribution of nature-based solutions to reduce those impacts, uh, they focus on the global north. So understanding what works in the global south is uh, especially a research priority. And there is an urgent need to develop effective approaches to adaptation that address the, re the needs and priorities of those most at risk. And in order to understand that, we need to focus on people, what makes them vulnerable, and how can nature-based solutions play a role in reducing their vulnerability as part of a wider package of measures. What is vulnerability? Well, according to the IPCC, it's the degree to which a system is susceptible to or unable to cope with adverse effects of climate change, including climate variability and extremes. So we're really focusing on the system in which people are a part that makes them susceptible to climate hazards, climate risks, and so on. And climate, uh, uh, sorry, vulnerability is reduced by uh, reducing people's exposure and their sensitivity to those uh, hazards. And it's also reduced by increasing their adaptive capacity. So those are the three components, exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. Now, not many uh, vulnerability kind of frameworks take into account the way that ecosystem condition plays a role in vulnerability across each of those three components. And that's especially relevant um, in the rural global south where people's vulnerability to climate impacts and their adaptive strategies um, often incorporate uh, nature in different ways. 
And we can get at that, we can unpack that using a social ecological systems framework um, to understand the various pathways through which an NBS might reduce people's vulnerability. Okay. So what have we done in this study? Well, we've uh, based it on a systematic map of peer-reviewed studies that Alex and others at MBSI have uh, recently published. You may well have seen it, but we've updated that systematic map now to include studies published up till 2020. And what we get is a subset of those studies that focus on rural areas in low and lower middle income countries. And there are 85 nature-based interventions that we studied here and analyzed for their vulnerability reduction outcomes. Um, and what we see is that those studies uh, encompass a wide diversity of ecosystems, climate impacts, intervention types, and institutions. Okay, but what about results? So actually, I think that the results are surprisingly clear. Um, uh, what you see in this graph is the uh, outcomes of these nature-based uh, in uh, cases, nature-based solutions, um, divided according to whether they gave positive uh, outcomes, negative outcomes, or unclear or mixed outcomes. And across these six potential pathways of vulnerability reduction that we studied, you see that the vast majority, in fact, 95% of um, these uh, interventions deliver positive outcomes. And you see that the negative and the unclear outcomes are much, much more um, diminished. Uh, so yes, so we see a very clear signal here in the data. And just to unpack that in a couple of other ways. So um, apart from the fact that overall, they gave a 95% um, signal in terms of positive outcomes, we also see that 88% um, of NBS cases reduced vulnerability by um, reducing the vulnerability of the ecosystems on which people depend, whether it's for livelihoods or, and so on. You know, ecosystems that are a part of people's lives. Uh, but then the other side of things is that uh, MBS also reduced people's vulnerability in a number of other ways that aren't often considered in these kinds of analysis. So for example, they might have reduced exposure of community assets such as houses and other kind of social assets in a community. They might have strengthened resource management institutions that pre-existed the uh, NBS, or they might have built social capacity. So it's really that um, contribution of NBS is really important to take in, into consideration as well. So apart from the uh, analyses I just showed you, we also studied um, well, what was it that made these NBS effective? How were they reducing people's vulnerability? And that was um, what we found was that it was just as important to consider the social and the political aspects of uh, NBS as the technical elements of those interventions. So for example, issues about uh, rights and access or the level of social inequality and so on, that those were important determinants of what made MBS effective, as much as the technical elements, such as how the projects were very specifically designed in their parameters and so on. And related to that, we also observed that NBS outcomes, um, how they were distributed, you know, who benefited and so on, that was strongly influenced by the formal and informal institutions okay, that were either in present, were, were already existed, you know, outside of the MBS, or were introduced by the MBS as well. So to take into account those social institutions that actually play a strong role in, uh, in uh, distributing their outcomes and in uh, how effective they were. So some recommendations then. So what I would recommend to both policymakers and practitioners from this study is to pay close attention to what makes people vulnerable to climate change impacts, to listen to how people themselves use ecosystems as part of locally led adaptation solutions, and to consider social aspects of nature-based solutions, not just for equity, but also for success. So those are the findings. 
This is based on a study that we have in review in a journal called Climate and Development. These are the, my co-authors that I was so happy to do this study with and this analysis. Um, you can email me for the preprint uh, of the um, paper, or perhaps we can even share it in the chat. And I would uh, strongly recommend, if you're interested, to uh, check out the Nature Based Solutions Initiative website or even scan this QR code for the policy brief uh, that this uh, is associated with this presentation. Okay, and we'll be sharing that on social media and so on from today. So thank you so much. And I, I hope I um, gave some insights into these uh, important issues. And thanks again for the opportunity. Thank you, Stephen, that was wonderful. And again, we'll have time for questions and discussions at the end. I'd like to, to now open up the floor to, to Tasvia, to his name, Tasvia, please, please um, share your screen and, and introduce yourself to us. Thank you. Yes, just doing this. Uh, can you share, uh, can you see this screen properly? Sure. That's perfect, Tasvia. That works very well. Okay. So just uh, let me know if you do not hear my voice or if there is anything, just cut me out. And just uh, uh, give me alert when, when I have one minute left. So, okay. So to start with, I am not sure that, uh, like how many people have uh, like joined today from across the globe and if I should share my like presentation with good morning, afternoon or night. So um, just, I'd just like to welcome everyone to my presentation on the if evidence of effectiveness of the nature-based solutions for addressing climate change, a case study of Bangladesh. Uh, I'm Tasfia Tasnim, uh, currently working as a program coordinator of nature-based solutions at the International Center for Climate Change and Development. Uh, so to start with, um, so this is part of a study that uh, ICAD and Nature Based Solutions Initiative at the Oxford has taken, and I'm part uh, like sharing few parts of that uh, session. Uh, so to start with, we all acknowledge that nature based solutions have a great potential for locally led climate action, but there is lack of evidence on the effectiveness, which is hindering the uptake on uh, policy, um, uh, po uh, up uptake of NBS in the policy level. So for the, but for the countries uh, like lower middle income countries like Bangladesh, which is really vulnerable to the impacts of cyclones, um, uh, floods, uh, salinity intrusion, droughts, um, heat waves, uh, flooding, and many other disasters, uh, like solutions, uh, like nature-based solution, uh, like nature solutions can be very cost-effective, which can address, um, um, uh, uh, which can address like uh, climate uh, change and other uh, natural hazards. Uh, but uh, the thing is that there is no synthesis of the outcomes which can be uh, accessible to the policymakers. And uh, uh, like though Bangladesh has been implementing uh, NBS since like for past 50 to 60 years, uh, 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 we like a uh, few of the studies found out that most of the ad adaptation projects that are approved by Bangladesh Climate Change Trust Fund were um, a bit mostly uh, uh, focused on engineer solutions rather than uh, ecosystem or, or other nature-based approaches. So to address the gaps on synthesizing and analyzing the effectiveness, we have uh, like tried to uh, uh, like follow these two objectives to identify the robust evidence on the effectiveness of NBS in Bangladesh for addressing climate change and natural hazards and to assess the enabling factors that can accelerate and expand the uptake of good quality of NBS. So for the uh, methodology, we have followed a systematic literature review, which can clearly show in this diagram. So we have mainly uh, searched for uh, academic papers through uh, Scopus and web, web of Science and non-academic reports uh, based on a few major projects on uh, community-based natural resource management or EB approaches on the effectiveness of NBS in Bangladesh and out of like through a thorough screening process, we have uh, finally selected 56 academic uh, literatures and four, four uh, uh, great literatures 
out of which we have uh, got 89 interventions that we have uh, counted as NBS and we have explored the outcomes on those uh, uh, interventions. So uh, now coming to for like the, uh, the different types of NBS interventions that are reported in, in Bangladesh, much of the literature focuses on more like sustainable uh, crop production followed by um, uh, like uh, wetland management and agroforestry and then protection and restoration of um, uh, mangrove, then protecting and restoring of uh, like terrestrial forest and finally uh, 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 like restoring uh, freshwater and coastal habitats. So under the different uh, key intervent, uh, uh, like under the different ecosystems, here's the list of uh, key in base interventions that we found out and explored in the paper, which I won't go into that much detail today. Uh, uh, let us look into what are the outcomes that we have got from these uh, in base interventions in terms of addressing climate change and disaster risk reduction. So we see that NBS ad, uh, offers various uh, uh, like so uh, benefits, uh, including like uh, different development benefits uh, and and uh, climate change and disaster risk uh, um, uh, reduction benefits as well. So today I'll, I'm just going to focus on the ones that are related to the uh, uh, addressing the impacts of climate change and disaster risk reduction. Uh, so these are the ones that are. Uh, hi, uh, uh, linked with CCA and TRR. Um, so now uh, uh, let us see that how these different type of NBS interventions uh, play roles in positive outcomes towards addressing uh, climate action. So for greenhouse gas reduction, uh, mangroves were estimated to sequester carbon four times faster uh, than uh, land-based forest. Uh, if we look into the uh, like uh, addressing coastal floods, erosion, and salinization issue, we can see that like mangroves uh, protect uh, vast areas of coastal land and also save uh, uh, like million of people lives and assets, and which is uh, like uh, during during cyclones or floods, which which avoid damage worth uh, one point five six uh, uh, US. Uh, a dollar US dollar billion per year on average. Uh, then uh, coming to the inland uh, flooding and erosion, uh, it has been found out that soil erosion uh, uh, can be lower three to four times uh, uh, if if uh, like in a forested catchment than in a cleared catchment. And if you look into like how uh, uh, it in base interventions are uh, addressing like like. Um, uh, reducing the wind damage, uh, uh, it's it it says that uh, like um, uh, when there is uh, mangroves, it actually protects the uh, like uh, um, uh, protects uh, the assets uh, and 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 uh, reduce the velocity of the uh, wind as well. And home gardens such as taller uh, trees at, around the boundaries help to protect from wind and st storm damages as well. Uh, so what we have found, uh, like though there are many positive uh, benefits, but what we have found out is that most studies did not report evidence of the biodiversity benefits. Uh, because these studies, uh, like most of the studies are largely confined to the, uh, like reporting the species rich, uh, richness and they do not, there, there is no clear uh, 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 like uh, definition of uh, like whether the biodiversity benefits have been achieved uh, or not. Uh, for example, uh, like for social forestry, uh, uh, we have seen that uh, uh, sometimes there uh, there is use of fast growing non native timber species, so which is uh, somewhat contradict to the uh, definition of NBS that Alex has presented uh, in the in the, in the very beginning. So to determine the biodiversity, one more minute, Sasha, one more minute. To determine the biodiversity benefits, it is important to report on the baseline and the contractual uh, scenario. Then coming to the point that there are gaps in the evidence of um, uh, like in Bangladesh for certain types of NBS, including urban green infrastructures. Uh, while also conducting the analysis from the gray literatures, we found out that 
uh, like there is weak evidence on the outcomes because the evidence base is not that much strong because they did like the creditors did not follow consistent methodology and uh, like there is uh, inconsistent use of like qualitative and quantitative data in some some cases also uh, integration of NBS into policy is currently uh, somewhat consist inconsistent because though EBA or NBS is uh, like um, incorporating is a, a major priority for the policy, uh, uh, sometimes there are cultural biases that that more investment goes towards the engineered ex uh, uh, like approaches. So we can see that there is lack of awareness on uh, of the potential of NBS amongst the policymakers and. Hence, there is lack because there is lack of implementation guidelines and financial supports. So now coming to the way forward, uh, uh, like as we have seen that there are gaps in like evidence uh, having uh, like urban NBS or or monitoring and evaluation. We are saying that there is need to we need to strengthen the evidence base following more systematic approach, which can monitor, evaluate, report the process and the outcomes. Um, and, and this will help to integrate the NBS interventions in the policy and the current uh, uh, like short, medium and longer term uh, strategy, strategies and plans of the, of the country. We also need to investigate in the potentials of nature-based solutions for economic recovery. Actually, currently, uh, uh, NBSI, ICAD, and NBS Peru are conducting a project to, like, short-term project to identify the economic recovery potential of India. So that is very interesting, and you can find out more about that project from our website. Uh, also, urbanization is a growing uh, 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 challenge, and 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 it is highly vulnerable. And there is also climate displacement issues. So there is, we should uh, like the uh, urban uh, um, like agencies and planners. They should make uh, invest in more into like urban NBS to and and make NBS in the urban development as an integral part. Uh, lastly, to communicate uh, NBS uh, amongst like everyone, like in the researchers and through the researchers and policymakers is very important. So we all should abide by the nature based solutions guideline that uh, like IUCN or NBSI uh, has 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 designed. So in that way, I would like to conclude by saying that uh, this is one uh, like kind of first uh, review paper that uh, like the whole uh, like NBSI and ICAT team has tried to conduct it. So thanks to all the uh, like the lead author, like Alison, for leading the process of this paper and all the co-authors, uh, Haseeb, uh, Beth, uh, Alex, and Natalie for, for contributing to the, uh, uh, like, uh, to developing this paper. So we look for, like, this paper will is get going to be published very soon, uh, hopefully, and uh, you all can find found out more information in our uh, Indies Bangladesh website. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, sorry for taking one minute extra. Thank you very much, Tasya. And um, if you could uh, kindly stop sharing your screen, that was wonderful showing the importance of uh, bringing together the evidence base um, for, uh, uh, for policymakers. Um, I'd like to, to, to introduce the floor now to our fourth um, speakers, fourth presentation, the fourth presentation by Samina Mahmouda. And if you could please uh, share your, your screens, um, that would be fantastic. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Can you see the slide? Yes. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you and good morning and good afternoon, everyone, based on where you are at currently. I'm Samina and I have um, I am working uh, at the International Center for Climate Change and Development. Um, I have my colleague and one of the co-authors, Mahmouda, uh, as well. Mahmouda, would you like to come in and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, uh, Samina. So hello, everyone. It's Mahmouda. Um, I'm currently working as a senior research officer at Sajida Foundation under their Climate Change and Disaster Management Unit. Also, I'm working with ICAD as a research consultant. So today I'm going to talk about a paper written with my colleague Samina on how NBS uh, has been addressed in the policies of Bangladesh. So now I would, uh, I would like to request her to start the presentation and I will come later. Yes, thank Samina, you. Please go ahead. Yeah. 
so we are going to be presenting our recently published article on nature-based solutions titled the integration of nature-based solutions into climate adaptation policy and planning in bangladesh I'll briefly introduce the concept and the method methodology used in this paper, and then quickly go over how we analyze the policies. And Mahmouda will give a bit detail on the findings and discussion and some policy recommendations regarding NBS. So nature-based solutions, or shortly what we call NBS, has gained momentum, momentum in the recent years. And there has been a lot of studies going around in this concept to define it, understand it, and to figure out its potentials. So what is NBS? It, is, it broadly describes nature-oriented actions that address societal issues like food and water insecurity, natural disasters, poverty, and at the same time also provide biodiversity benefits. Studies have also framed NBS as an umbrella concept which incorporates ecological restoration, ecosystem-based adaptation, or green infrastructures. There are case studies around the world and in Bangladesh where the practice of NBS albeit informally exists. However, the ter terminology and the potential of NBS is yet to be translated into comprehensive policy action in Bangladesh. What we did in this study is that we analyzed the national policies of Bangladesh to understand the development and current state of NBS and its related concepts in the policy dis um, discourse, and then presented several policy insights and recommendations to incorporate NBS into the national policies to address climate change. In terms of our methodology, um, we selected relevant keywords based on preliminary review of literatures in order to conduct the systematic policy analysis. We approached NBS as an umbrella term and searched for the keywords nature-based solutions, ecosystem, ecosystem-based adaptation, green infrastructure, and ecosystem services. We also included the keyword disaster management to examine whether the aforementioned approaches were considered as tools for addressing climate change or disaster management. We selected 20 Bangladesh national policies across three decades for the analysis, dividing them in three subcategories, development, climate change and management, and environment and biodiversity. So uh, the next three slides actually shows the summarized review of the policies across three sectors in figures and how and to what extent nature-oriented actions has been addressed. I won't go into details of each of them, but to give an overview of it, the term NBS is mentioned in only one policy and for the first time, which is the eighth uh, five-year plan, uh, which was uh, published uh, this year, but there were no details of NBS in it. Rather, it was implied that NBS would be prioritized in the upcoming National Adaptation Plan of Bangladesh. Other than that, the rest of the policies mentions the other nature and ecosystem oriented actions like eba ecosystem services and green infrastructure but proper guidelines for implementation or monitoring or funding is not quite established we'll talk more details in the findings and discussion section so i'll now hand over to mahota here is the um, summarized overview of uh, policies so mahota please go ahead Thank you uh, so much, Samina. So uh, like there are some uh, differences in the concept of NBS in the existing policies of Bangladesh, like what we actually uh, found from our analysis. So in the policy document, EBA, green infrastructure, uh, ecosystem services are used as NBS, although their uh, meaning is different. For an example, EBA focuses on particularly community-based adaptation strategies by emphasizing sustainable management, conservation, and restoration of ecosystem, while NBS differ from traditional biodiversity conservation and management approaches. In terms of greenhouse infrastructure, it is a, a planning approach which can provide strategic guidance and uh, for integrating NBS in developing green space networks at various scales. On the other hand, ecosystem services are often uh, valued for immediate benefits to human well-being uh, and economic, while NBS emphasize on the benefits of uh, to uh, people or environment uh, itself, which allows for sustainable solutions that are able to respond uh, to environmental changes and hazards in the long term. The results of the policy review suggested that uh, 
throughout the past three decades, several policies in Bangladesh emphasized ecosystem-oriented approaches, such as uh, ecosystem-based adaptation, green building, uh, or eco-building, enhancing biodiversity, conservation, and natural resources, uh, and disaster management. And currently, NBS is uh, gaining uh, rapid attention in the global climate change discussions. For example, the United uh, Nation Action uh, like Climate Action uh, Summit of 2019 included NBS as one of the main tracks. And uh, uh, 25th Conference of the Parties to the UNFCCC discussed NBS, and China and New Zealand created a nature based solutions coalition to align and keep up with global knowledges and trends. It is important that NBS um, concepts become recognized by policymakers and also at the national level to realize its potential uh, in the ground. Uh, so the people and the government of Bangladesh have been uh, appreciated of uh, nature-based actions and activities, which is evident in the policy documents. Additionally, the uh, eight five years plan prioritizes NBAs in the National Adaptation Plan of Bangladesh. Um, as an emerging terms, policymakers and stakeholders can continue discussing uh, like NBAs to carry out effective implementation and inclusion of this framework for the climate change adaptation and mitigation in the national policy discussions. But unfortunately, funding for NBS related actions um, infrequently occur in the selected national policies. For example, some uh, uh, like uh, some policies propose uh, provisions for uh, green tax and payment for ecosystem services. However, potential interventions, donor fi uh, financing and allocations strategies for the ecosystem oriented approaches are not outlined in these policies. There are uh, funding mechanisms for climate change adaptation is issues such as like adaptation fund, green climate fund, and Bangladesh climate change resilience fund. Depending on project objectives, uh, the government can obtain financial NBS also require challenges and limitations. In terms of participation, uh, like participation and equity, this is there is a lack of public understanding and about the concept of NBS. There is also a lack of recognition that social and cultural elements are also important to promote sustainable uh, development. Next slide, please. So uh, based on the analysis, there has some issues that should be addressed uh, to integrate the holistic indicators of NBS at the national policy levels. So NBS needs to be adopted across national development, uh, climate change, environment, and uh, forestry policy. The government needs to ensure uh, coordination among Amongst uh, like various sectors to ensure overall sustainability in the future through an integrated approaches. As NBS is an umbrella concept uh, emphasizing multiple sectors, coordination sectors, uh, these uh, var like various sectors is vital. Financial is also a vital issue in implementing various uh, interventions of NBS. Like some policies highlight several funding mechanism for environment forest and climate change program. Future policies can develop uh, like specific uh, provision for funding and investment for specific interventions of NBS. Um, it is highly important to formulate specific indicators for monitoring and evaluation mechanism, especially for NBS and integrated these sectors, various policies to evaluate this effectiveness and ensure optimum benefits of NBS as the cost effectiveness of NBS interventions compared to arrange like alternative and other resilience to climate change are still not clear. A national platform for NBS can be developed to provide a common knowledge sharing ground for multiple stakeholders, including policymakers, uh, local communities, experts, and other uh, concerns policy, uh, like parties to discuss the various challenges and to develop strategies uh, for proper implementation of NBS. This platform can work in various stream of NBS, including policy advocacy, research, 
and the knowledge management capacity building of the uh, like concerned stakeholders. Uh, NBS aim to ensure that uh, policies are inclusive and participatory. So as women, youth, and like other marginal uh, groups are of uh, like often highly vulnerable to climatic threats, they should be considered as important agent in the NBS implementation across these policies. Uh, this is all from my end. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Samina. That was wonderful. Apologies for the interruption, everyone. Um, now we'll we'll have about 20, 20 minutes or so for for some initial reflections um, from the panelists. And in addition to, um, we'll have uh, reflections from from three additional uh, panelists. Uh, Dr. Misaka Hetiarchi. Um, my apologies if if I mispronounce your name. Uh, who's a senior fellow and, and trading lead um, at the FGG program for the World Wildlife Fund. And we also have Mr. Chris um, Henderson, the head of agriculture for practical action. And uh, I believe it is it is also our, our hope to have Mr. Rakib Al Amin, um, a country representative from Bangladesh. Tasfia, has Rakib been able to join us? No, no, he won't be. He's okay, my my apologies, everyone. Do we have any anyone else joining us on the panel? No, it's the only two people. Fantastic. So I think um, I, I'd like to start off the discussion by by asking uh, Dr. Masaka and Mr. Mr. Chris Henderson um, their um, uh, one key take home message um, from what they've heard today for policy or practice. We've heard a lot about policy, but some of the discussions are, are also relevant for practice. And so I'd, leave, I'd like to leave this quite open to start off the discussion um, to hear um, your initial reflections. If, it, if it's open, I'll jump in. Um, Please go ahead. I'm really impressed with the quality of the analysis, the fact that this research is going on, the fact that it's um, being and it's engaging at the policy level. I think, uh, Alex, you hit on probably my observation is, I really wanted to see what this means in practice. Now, Tasfia did give some examples, but I'm an agriculturist, as you know, and I think of agriculture as a nature-based solution. I also think of these rural contexts as the people live there, they, they need income, um, they need food security, they need, um, resilient livelihoods, as well as the ability to being able to cope with shocks. So it needs to be practical. Now, I've been to southern Bangladesh myself, and I remember having huge discussions about, well, what, what should happen in this landscape? People say, well, they, they can short cycle shrimp, or they can be crab fattening, or they could be things like this that could bring incomes. But that loses so much of the diversification yeah. that you see in sustainable uh, agricultural um, farming systems or rural economies. And the alternatives, by the way, are huge. The, the, the opportunities with um, um, vertical gardening, uh, crop livestock interactions, how you sort of use vermiculture. And, and um, the, it, see, uh, it seems there's a big, big question of how policy can support appropriate livelihoods and land use and which, which sort of way it could go. And there are like simple solutions, or they're not simple, but there are solutions which are quite um, I don't know, early returns, high yielding, some of that, but they're not uh, biodiverse. They're not, they're not um, they don't involve a lot of people and they don't really, they often involve people who are slightly better off or who have access to resources. And I think we need to focus more on that in practice. Um, and um, I think we need some more, more examples of, of that. Um, and so that's what I would encourage, um, that we need to make this link and not just talk about NBS, the acronym, which people get, but talk about what it means. And it means agriculture-based livelihoods. And there are very clear choices to be made. Uh, I, I think I'll stop there because it's a discussion. I have another sort of example of intervention that might help. But um, for discussion, but that's the sort of reflection I had on what I heard, is making that connection. 
Yeah, thank you, Chris. I very, very, very much um, appreciate the need to make that discussion. And thank you for highlighting the importance of, um, of really focusing on, on the local context to, the, to design tailored um, solutions. As you mentioned, the, the, the NBS umbrella represents a, a wide range of different actions and even within the agricultural, um, within agricultural systems, there is a, a plethora of different actions that, that can be um, uh, implemented and then it's very much both about people and nature. I wanted to to see if um, if Dr. Misaka had any um, had any reflections um, uh, on what Chris just said. Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks, uh, Alex. And I'll just build up on what uh, Chris said. Completely agreeing on that. Uh, and uh, again, like thanks for the three great. Uh, presentations, uh, Stephen, Tasfia, and uh, Mahamuda. I forget the name of the, uh, the fourth person. Um, so I think uh, all three studies uh, were kind of mutually complementing and reinforced uh, the, the main points uh, raised by uh, each other. So one kind of um, take home point which uh, which emerged in all three presentations that I noticed was the issue of like the importance of social and political parameters uh, uh, and and uh, uh, suitability right uh, uh, of of different nature based uh, solutions um, like in different projects. Uh, so when you are evaluating uh, the performance of nature-based uh, solutions, uh, it's important. Like it, it's a, it's a it's a it's a common pitfall uh, that uh, we we confine ourselves to the technical uh, and scientific uh, parameters. Right? Um, and and measure the performance just by that, uh, but but the uh, like you you hit uh, blind alleys or uh, like major difficulties when these things are not uh, properly accepted or don't properly fit into the social expectations, the the political systems and so on. So they should be uh, social and political uh, parameters uh, should be a should be key criteria uh, of evaluation uh, of, of uh, NBSs. And connected to that, uh, I think Tasfia made this important point about institutional barriers, right? Like uh, lack of codes of practice, right? Uh, lack of, um, uh, say, the uh, nature-based uh, solutions not being properly incorporated uh, within uh, the permitting procedures or the government procedures, uh, the, the technical codes of practice that different engineering organizations, uh, disaster risk reduction or disaster management organizations are using. Uh, so we actually, in, in policy language, we call it uh, a policy path dependence, right? Like the non-nature-based solutions or rather hard engineering solutions uh, top-down methods uh, have been ha have been entrenched in the system, uh, you know, uh, pretty much for uh, so many decades now, uh, and so they have created a path dependence where, in each cycle of decision making, there's a tendency to pick up these uh, hard engineering-based methods, or uh, you know, as Chris said, like non-nature-based uh, methods, so narrow-minded uh, decision-making processes them to be perpetuated because those methods are not very much entrenched into our, not only to the institutions, but also our thinking, our education, uh, training and uh, things like that. So uh, I think just to elaborate the, the simple point that uh, uh, Tasfia uh, brought up uh, about like not having technical guidelines, proper technical guidelines and um, codes of practice and proper procedures to incorporate these methods in our decision making, uh, it, it, it is actually a, like a far bigger policy and institutional matter. So those are the, uh, I'll just stop here. Those are the two uh, 
key points that I saw that uh, can be taken forward uh, to the discussion. Thanks, Evan. Yes, thank you. And um, uh, those are, are very important points, um, which really, um, yeah, both on both looking at the the local, the implementation scale, as well as the the, the national policy landscape. And and I think um, I think the last point you've mentioned is particularly important because um, knowledge, the lack of knowledge, is obviously a key barrier. But there are ingrained decision making processes that 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 even in the face of knowledge increasing knowledge there are, there are there are these ingrained ways of doing which um which can um which can uh hamper the the scaling up of nature-based uh, solutions um in um uh, in policy and and in relation to your first point about the importance of social and and political factors i think that's that's uh, for me at least that's that's really a key take-home message from this discussion and I'd, I'd like to to actually uh, to keep the discussion flowing a bit on this, I'd like to get Stephen's perspective on on the importance of these factors because I think that the work that he shows in relation to um, how nature-based solutions um, intervene or shape vulnerability, I think makes the, the 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 point quite clear the the importance of social and and political factors um, as well as economic, in addition to just the, the technical aspects of interventions. So perhaps Stephen, you'd like to say a. Uh, a thing or two about that. Yeah, thank you, Alex um, and Misaka. I, uh, I can only really echo what you're saying and um, to uh, reflect on the potential risks for nature-based solutions, that they might fall into some of these kind of um, traps, if you like, that they don't take advantage of their, of their potential. And Misaki, you said that uh, you know there are these cycles of of thinking over time uh, that that tend to perpetuate patterns that drive us towards hard infrastructural solutions sometimes. But I would argue that the same thing applies within nature-based solutions. Uh, and I think you you did make this point in one way or another that you know even if it's ecosystem-based, it can still become very technical, and that can uh, be to the detriment ultimately of the project outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I had the pleasure of uh, meeting Misaka in Colombo when I was doing my research in on my PhD on ecosystem-based adaptation in Sri Lanka. So I studied uh, several ecosystem-based adaptation projects in great detail, and I can only echo that my uh, kind of fine-grained analysis in Sri Lanka kind of really uh, is reflected in this more generalized analysis here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, that's fantastic. Yeah, these ingrained ways of, of, of doing, so to speak, also affect practice very much. Um, I, I, I do want to hear reflections as well from, from Tasfia, uh, as well as um, Samina and Mahmoud on, 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 on the national policy context in Bangladesh and, and what they see as the way forward to um, in addition to, 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 to knowledge production, if they have any points to make on how to um, to mainstream nature-based solutions uh, in policy in a way that addresses some of the some of these barriers. So, how do we get policymakers to really to really um, uh, grasp the value of of, um, of nature-based solutions to address the challenges that you've mentioned? Okay, so I can come in. Um, yeah, so. What NBS does it, it goes beyond the traditional biodiversity conservation and management principles and integrate the societal, societal factors like the human well being and poverty alleviation, right? So, realizing its potential and understanding its benefits. And what is more important is also understanding the trade offs to get the best out of it. Like it is, it is kind of a barrier while promoting in the, the integration of NBS. Um, it is also important to keep in mind that there are possibilities of trade-offs arising from climate policies if they encourage NBS with low biodiversity value, such as afforestation with non-native monocultures, and this can lead to maladaptation. So there is a need for clear understanding of NBS and effective consultation between public um, and policymakers to ensure uh, is, uh, is important to ensure successful implementation as well. So. Thank you. No, that's fantastic. 
um, yeah, no, that's that's really important. And um, I'd like to remind uh, everyone, by the way, that that if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the in the chat, and we'll have time to um, uh, to address them um, to address them um, uh, in in a in a little while. Um, I, and another question I did anybody did anybody want to come in? Sorry, was that? Um, yeah, actually, um, I want to add. Oh, I apologize. Now. I apologize. Yeah, please. No, no, it's fine. So, like, uh, what we feel like to uh, minimal the climate uh, vulnerabilities, uh, it is important to con uh, consider traditional uh, knowledge, traditional practices, like indigenous knowledge and traditional practices. Uh, and nature-based solutions in the policy uh, document documents. And uh, in this regard, uh, local actors need to take part in a policy-making process because uh, they actually know better than us like how to um, restore the environment. And uh, in terms of barrier, I, I would like to say uh, there have like knowledge gap already like two of our uh, speakers mentioned about that uh, and I also agree with uh, their points yeah there have like political institutional and uh, uh, like uh, knowledge related barriers that are most dominated barriers for like envious so we need to uh, plan or like we need to recreate uh, our policies uh, by considering all of these uh, issues yeah Thank you. Yes, thank you. That that's fantastic. No, I appreciate it. Um, uh, uh, are there any, uh, Dr. Misaka and and uh, and Chris? Would you like to 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 step in at this point for any additional reflections? Otherwise, I'll I'll move on with uh, some additional questions. Um, yeah. No, I think we could move on with the. Uh... So one of the one of the questions I had for you actually, uh, uh, Masaka, is is in relation to scaling up uh, NBS and policy, we uh, but also this is relevant for practice. We need to 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 bring together a, a range of different knowledge types. Mm -hmm. um, there's a term that that we use transdisciplinarity often mm -hmm. to 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 reflect that, and this is knowledge across disciplines and knowledge. Uh, uh, that, that different types of stakeholders hold, uh, both academic and non-academic. How do we promote effective transdisciplinary work um, to implement and, 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 and deliver nature-based solutions that, uh, that address people's needs? What is one key, one key message you, you perhaps you could share with us on how to promote this type of, um, this type of work to, to establish these partnerships that deliver the knowledge um, mm -hmm. to inform practice? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I think, uh, thanks for that uh, question, Alex, and it's, it's uh, <laughs> I would say it's the million dollar question in nature-based solutions. Um, uh, let, me, let me start it from, rather than informing practice, if we start from practice itself. Um, one, uh, I mean, there are so many factors uh, causing this issue, but uh, of um, I mean, which is uh, blocking uh, you know interdisciplinarity, right? In in uh, uh, in um, development projects, or uh, I mean, it's it's not only confined to uh, implementing nature-based solutions. Like it's uh, uh, any these you know disaster risk management. Uh, project or rural development project that this this problem comes in uh, so uh, in so our like we approach nature based uh, methods so just to just a small clarification in at WWF we are a little bit reluctant to use the word solutions uh, because that kind of makes it um, say one off or uh, kind of conclusive uh, we think all these um, methods or features, uh, like one uh, thing, one positive thing about nature-based uh, methods is that, uh, you know, they can keep growing, right? Um, so rather than calling them solutions, 
we prefer calling them nature-based methods or nature-based features. Um, so uh, we approach nature-based methods uh, in a disaster risk management uh, uh, perspective. And so whenever nature-based uh, methods are adopted uh, to uh, for disaster risk management, specifically uh, uh, flood uh, risk management, uh, one key barrier, right, for even considering nature-based methods uh, in um, especially in flood risk management is the the planners often uh, the projects are designed in a way that uh, the planners often jump into the methods directly right uh, they they approach a problem with a, a so-called solution in mind right whether it's a, a dam or a barrage or or a flood wall or even a nature-based solution as as uh, Stephen just said, like it's it's this this narrow thinking, one-sided thinking is not confined to hard engineering or hard infrastructure. It's, it's there in, in the nature-based world as well. So we start thinking with a solution. So if we if we start in a problem-oriented approach, uh, define our problem well in, in disaster management world, like do a comprehensive risk assessment, right? define your uh, problem uh, and then uh, uh, formulate very clear uh, risk management objectives. So then a world of um, like a universe of nature-based, uh, non-structural, as well as uh, hard engineering solutions would be available for you to approach or achieve those objectives. And to do that, when you, when you when you start it from that end, starting from the risk uh, with a risk-based approach in mind, you, you just can't uh, be like, uh, you, you are compelled to kind of cross your boundaries. Like you have to consult uh, you know, risk, uh, risk management specialists, uh, sociologists and uh, ecologists. Like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like, if I just take an example, uh, take a flood risk management project as an example, right? Um, so I, I'm not trying to idealize this situation, but that in the least, that is an approach which should actually make it necessary for the people involved uh, in, in, in um, managing a project or trying to solve a problem uh, to, to step into other people's shoes, right? And, and try to formulate an objective. But if you start with a method, uh, whether it's a hard, whether it's a dam, or whether it's upper watershed restoration project, whether it's a wetland restoration project, then you are starting with one uh, discipline, right? And everything else becomes subordinate to that. Uh, so, I mean, maybe in a like a winding way that that is like a like a very uh, complex answer that I can give you to your rather very specific question, Alex. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I think that's extremely important for the practice uh, dimensions of nature-based solutions. And I, I would like to... Alex, if I could very quickly, uh, Chris was trying to say something. In the previous yes, yes, I, absolutely. I've seen that. Thank you so much, Asif. Um, I'm going to, to leave the, the floor open actually for, for Chris and, um, and then Stephen as well. I'd like to hear from him. But um, specifically on this point, because I think some of his findings um, in relation to to um, to the the factors that mediate the effectiveness speak to that. Um, I, I'd like to remind everyone also that this what I think um, Masaka just just explained to us really resonates with criterion one of the 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 IUCN standard. The point being that. Um, uh, the solution should f first and foremost be defined by by, by local needs, the, the perspectives of, of local stakeholders, um, if I understood correctly. And I found it interesting that that actually, yes, instead of coming in with a predefined solution, with a predefined vision, it's really important to um, to ask what to frame the problem right um, through through um, a process that involves genuine. Uh, engagement of, of, of local rights holders and stakeholders um, and then the, yeah the risk-based approach makes um, makes a particular sense in relation to um, 
uh, to, to developing effective NBS for, for vulnerability as well as, as climate change adaptation. So I think Chris, you'd like to, to jump in, please, please give your, your perspective if, if you've been able to, to unmute. Yeah, um, thanks. I think it was to present, prevent the Zoom bombers that everyone was locked briefly. Um, I'm worried about moving the conversation uh, around too much because I think you're having a valuable conversation about how you make um, link up sort of policy uh, and get sort of a, a people's voice into policy, especially around vulnerability and preventing disasters and flood risk and coastal zone management and that sort of thing. I think that is really important. So I'm more, I apologize if this takes us back a little bit, um, but I, I still am worried about a failure to connect with um, rural livelihoods and agriculture. I mean, it is absolutely vital. People have to feed themselves. People do want to get out of poverty. They do need to generate livelihoods. We see young people abandoning rural areas. And unless we find ways to have more nature-based um, rural economies and agricultural systems, I'm afraid to say there'll be more and more pressure on other things you've been talking about to reduce vulnerability, the mangrove zones, and the sunder bands and, and things like this. And, and there will be land use systems that actually increase vulnerability uh, because they remove the diversity in the system. Now, whether we talk about Southern Bangladesh or the hills of Peru or uh, semi-arid areas of um, Zimbabwe, I think you can more or less universally agree a principle is diversification in farming systems is, is what's needed crop livestock interactions, diversification in, in farming. And if that is not addressed, it's an elephant in the room for me. And I wanted just to say there are practical ways of doing it, which join these two communities of practice. One that we've experimented with in practical action are weather boards. Weather boards which have agricultural extension information, but also early warning systems in the weather board. So the early warning systems help with this sort of flood resilience, but that alone is still not enough because it needs linking with sort of the economy. Well, we seem to have lost Chris, unfortunately. We'll give Chris just a couple of seconds. Just to jump in there while, while Chris um, hopefully comes comes back to us um i think that that's a very important point and and, and how that economy oh, works so financial information go. market information that empowers people to make these the trick when they go digital. chris I, I i apologize we we seem to have missed the last minute of, of, of what you were explaining i think you, you started off by talking about the importance of diversification uh, in livelihoods is, is, uh, and, and that oh, livelihoods right. sh should be nature-based and you highlighting the points, I think, of information flow to... Yeah, yeah. I was giving a brief example of like how uh, weather boards, whether they're digital or whether they're manual weather boards, is a sort of practical way one can build capacity to combine, say, agri support for agricultural livelihoods with uh, early warning systems, uh, in, in, you know, for threats like floods, but also making it very uh, real in terms of market information can be included. So if we sort of think of services together in these rural communities, you can actually combine the sort of demands or needs in relation to risks and, and shocks like floods, but also the vital need for improving rural livelihoods and rural economies using agriculture, which is what people base the rural economy on and their livelihoods. Absolutely, no, thank you. That, that's very important. That also makes, makes a, a key point on, on the role of technology in, in, in creating these, um, uh, in supporting nature-based action in, in, in agricultural systems. Um, and I think it, it, it's it's it, this, this diversification in agricultural systems is very much a part of, of nature-based solutions. Um, uh, nature-based solutions are an umbrella concept, and 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 within the agricultural space, diversification is is uh, is a hallmark of developing resilient systems, which reduce uh, the need for for further expansion and and um, 
and um, and an unsustainable intensification as well. I, I'd like to, before um, shifting the focus back a little bit on 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 policy, because we do shift and shift back and forth at, from practice to policy. But I think that's where the that's where some of the key discussions are in order to make sure that the two speak to each other. Um, before moving on, I'd like to to see if if Stephen has any particular reflections on 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 these points. No, I'm fine. I, I can I can uh, share my thoughts later, Alex. Yeah. yeah, we we have. I think we have a few more minutes um, for a discussion. I are so, Stephen, would you like to jump in at this point, or is there anything you'd like to say? I think uh, there is a, an important point to be made here, uh, Chris. You made it. Uh, very well and so i'm not going to try and rehash it but just let's be realistic that some nbs advocates uh do shy away from you know agricultural mixes and the importance of livelihoods and stuff and there has been a slight skew towards you know traditional conservation approaches like uh, protected areas and stuff so let's kind of base ourselves on that pragmatism do you know what i mean and and I think from there, we, we do need to um, work more with kind of on-farm, uh, you know, needs and risks and that kind of stuff. Um, obviously, not everyone that lives in rural communities is a farmer, but there's a, there's a big role of farms in rural landscapes uh, in shaping risks for all kinds of people. Um, and, uh, yeah, one of the things that I think... Uh, we should be looking at both at the policy and the practical level is how to generate, how to reinvigorate these multifunctional landscapes, you know, that have uh, adaptation benefits, they have livelihood benefits, and they work for people, uh, including marginalized groups as well. And that's going to take a far bigger frame of reference than, uh, you know, what can one particular nature based intervention deliver. Um, but rather to think about how you counter kind of drivers of change at a more structural level towards, you know, kind of very optimized, uh, rationalized landscapes that deliver very short term benefits at the expense of, for want of a better word, resilience. Thank you. Think, yeah, thank you. That That's a very important point. Um, um, before, uh, in a minute or so, I'll open up the floor for, for audience questions. Uh, Hasib, if, if you've spotted anything in the chat that, 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 that we think we need to, to address, um, let me know. But I'd like to see if, if Tasvia and um, Samina and Mahmoud have any, have any last points on, to, to give a, a policy level reflection on, on, on these points. Uh, I can probably share uh, some experience that we had when we worked with the Ministry of Planning, uh, we actually like how to mainstream uh, NBS in the policy action. Actually, Ministry of Planning demanded that they need more evidence on like uh, how, uh, like on the numbers of like what type of benefits that NBS uh, deliver. So they wanted a list actually. So I would say that our paper and all of these recent papers that have come up, they, these show very uh, rigorous uh, effect, uh, like evidence on the effectiveness. And I think if we can communicate all this uh, with the policymakers, it will help um, uh, uh, like enable them like taking the decision. So I think communication is a very important thing from researchers to like from science to policy, like science policy nexus is very important, I would say, so that policymakers can take uh, more evidence-based decisions. So I think uh, we all need to, and I think here the dialogues and 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 uh, discussions play a key role uh, uh, to to take those decisions. Uh, here, here I'd stop. Thank you, thank you. And, and do you have any last reflections, uh, Samina and, um, and Mahmoud, Mahmoud on this? No, I, I, I don't think I have anything more to add. Like uh, okay. Tashvia, Tashvia has already mentioned how our ministries actually look at um, the NBS mainstreaming. So yeah, it, it is already, already covered. So 
Great, great. Thank you. Um, Hasib, I'd like to, to ask if there are any questions because I'm having trouble sifting through all the chats, to be honest. Is there, are there any questions we, we could potentially uh, address? Uh, there are certain questions that are being uh, answered or kind of responded to, maybe not to too specific, but by Alison as well as by Stephen. Uh, you know, we, we try to communicate some, but not obviously not all. If the panelists can take up some question if they want to, uh, they can always respond to that. For example, there is a question on how to balance, how to take forward both economic growth and NBS, because that's a big challenge for a country like Bangladesh, which is a very, uh, uh, because when we say development, obviously greenhouse gas emission, Hasibur Rahman made that question. That balance is a really ch big challenge, and we are trying uh, towards that. I can reflect on that as well later. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's that's a big question. There's a lot to unpack there. Out of balance, uh, 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 economic growth, growth, and, and nature-based solutions. But is is it really about balancing? Is it, is there a way that that is it about you know when what is it about is it about a, shall we say reframe um, uh, reframing what economic growth is for a country mm -hmm. like Bangladesh? Mm -hmm. What do you think? Um, I'll I'll leave the floor to to Hisib and. Um, and others, if, if you, I see, feel free to jump in on this point, and then we'll close off after that. How do we balance these these uh, policy objectives in in in, uh, in the global south? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Alex. I can I can share my uh, kind of uh, you know, concluding remark as well as I wanted to. Uh, it's a very fantastic discussion that we had uh, so far. The presentations were brilliant. And our panelists, they shared some interesting insight. We talked about interdisciplinarity. We talked about diversification, people-centered approach. We talked about flow of information. But I would like to point out one thing, just I'm not bypassing your question, Alex. I'm just trying to point out one uh, interesting thing that uh, Tasfi actually mentioned. When we were having this kind of discussion in Bangladesh early last year, we were struggling to convince, we were sharing the concept of NBS, but we have come a long way over the last 18 months or so. The reason I'm saying that now the demand uh, that was expressed there in March 2020, that where's the list, where's the effectiveness? I believe we managed to create some evidence uh, that yes, there are some challenges, but it works. But now the question is how to communicate that. I'd like to draw everybody's attention in the chat box. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter as well. There are two briefing notes on the first two papers, which in fact summarizes all the 20 odd paper, uh, uh, 20 odd pages in only uh, a few hundred words, only 500, uh, 1,000 words. So that is one way to communicate our uh, findings to our policymakers. And the second point I would like to make is things are changing, just to share with others, things are changing in terms of understanding nature-based solutions. There are challenges, Stephen and Misaka, they all talked about it. Uh, but I can, I, can, I can assure you that uh, from the government side, awareness level is much, much higher than that used to be even 18 months back. There are lots of risk reduction projects going on, training program, capacity development one. But you will be happy to know that we are now having discussion on nature-based solutions. So nature-based solution has been at least mainstreamed in the capacity development programs being run for the government officials, the project directors, and the project manager. I would like to capitalize on that uh, positive uh, development. So evidence is not enough. You need to communicate as well as build up the understanding of the people, the decision maker and policy maker. I should stop here now, Alex. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. Yes, thank you for these um, these closing statements. I, I think uh, I just want to thank the um, uh, the presenters and the panelists. Um, I, I, I found the the presentations particularly particularly pertinent, especially to, to begin reflecting on 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 the links uh, or the relationship between policy and practice in the context of NBS for vulnerability. 
uh, reduction and, and adaptation. And, and this is crucial. I mean, as billions of people face food, food insecurity by, by 2050, as a recent report shows from the, the IEP, and we know that vulnerability to climate change is, is a concern, particularly for, for countries in the global south, uh, given their, their, their high dependence on, on nature for, for basic needs. Um, I, I, I particularly would, uh, liked uh, Stephen's presentation on, on uh, expanding on how nature-based solutions shape vulnerability through both ecological and, and social pathways, emphasizing that, that it's, 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 it's uh, vulnerability re reduction and, and the relationship between vulnerability and NBS is complex and we need to pay attention to these different ways in which the actions uh, address vulnerability. And importantly, as I think the discussion mentioned, um, uh, it's not just about the, the, the technical elements of interventions, but it's about the, the social, the economic, and the political context in which they take place. And that has a key influence over their effectiveness. Um, and as, as Tasfi's presentation mentioned, I, NBS is, is also, you know, taking a step back. It, it, it is, if done right, it, it can be used as an integrated approach to tackle uh, sustainable development challenges in a cross-cutting way. Um, but importantly, I think it's clear that that effective governance is key to ensure the equitable distribution of benefits. Um, and finally, the Samina and Mahmoud's presentation on, 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 on the role of nature-based solutions and the incorporation of nature-based solutions in, in policy um, really showed that we need to move away from a siloed approach. I think that's a theme that's often mentioned, but today we still see the, it as a huge barrier to, to mainstreaming nature-based solutions. So we need coordination between ministries um, and um, uh, to overcome that uh, coordinated action that is across policy objectives. And also we need to, to, to really uh, look, uh, look at uh, strengthening monitoring and evaluation mechanisms uh, to, to, to inform these policies, to make sure that the local speaks to the national so to, um, uh, this, this cross-scalar approach, so to speak. So I'll leave it at that and, and I'll leave it for Tosfi for the, to close off the session. Thank you everyone. And, and thank you to, 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 to Chris and to Misaka for their, their helpful um, uh, comments in the panel discussion. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining in today. Uh, in the interest of time, I believe that we might miss few questions. So please feel free to post those in my email. I'm typing that again for your uh, information. So if you write back to me, I'll pass these questions to the uh, uh, potential speakers and panelists. And uh, like I can e connect you there as well. And uh, we will hopefully share uh, our session uh, like briefing and recording also uh, in our website, uh, through our Twitter uh, and like other social handles. So please follow through that. And I, I uh, like uh, sincerely like thanks everyone for their uh, 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 like active participation and thanks to Dr. Misaka and Chris for having some time and thanks to all the presenters and Dr. Hasib and finally Alex for moderating the this great panel. So thank you so much. Thank you, Tasfi. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day or evening. And thanks, thanks finally, Good morning. Thanks everyone for like the our resilience have. Uh, Focus who are with us today for managing this session. I think uh, yes. they have Thank you. provided great support to us for handling yeah. this issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you to the, the South Asia Resilience Hub. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank bye. You. Bye, bye everybody. Take care.